attention. Often grabs our attention. Congregations, many of you have been a part of other places, just as I am pastor, been a member of, of the churches. How the saints of God tend to start going around the church comparing themselves to somebody else. We often have what we call one upmanship in the congregation because somebody's deciding that they've got more spiritual gifts and they're more spiritual than the other person sitting in front, behind, next to, or across the aisle from them. But in God, there is no superiority or inferiority. Not only that, but God has so gifted his church that everybody has something they can do and contribute to the work of God to the glory of God. Everybody has something they can contribute. Everybody has something to give. Amen? This passage of scripture is about our understanding what kind of transforming influence the power of Christ has upon us. Paul takes this section, which is called the, the practical section of the book of Romans. It runs through chapter 16, and uh, it really amplifies what is called, uh, from Romans chapter 1 through 11, the theological section, or the doctrinal section. Paul takes all that he said in chapters 1 through 11, in chapters 12 through 14, gives us the practical implications and practical applications for living out the theological section. I hope that's not too heavy. I think you all know, are theological. We've got some Bible scholars in here this morning. And so when Paul talks in chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, he talks to us about how we are to have renewed minds. And he urges us, that's what the word beseech me, uh, that because of the mercies that have been given to us by God, we present ourselves, our bodies, as live sacrifices. In the Old Testament, uh, the Jews offered dead sacrifices on the altar to God, and God saw those dead sacrifices as being a means of putting aside their sins and forgiving them and giving them atonement for a year on an annual basis. But when Jesus came, he died once and for all so that we now become representatives of him and we give our lives in sacrificial service. And by doing that, we recognize that we don't have the mind of worldliness, trying to do things the way the world sees things and does them, but we are renewed daily in a transforming type of attitude that says we belong to God because God adopted us into his family and everywhere we go through our sacrificial living, through our presentation as being ambassadors of Christ, we show what is a good and perfect and acceptable good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Paul said it can be lived out, and he speaks about this grace, this business of grace. Grace being uh, God's unmerited favor. He speaks about the grace that is given to all of us because the grace has been given to him. And he said, I'm an apostle. I've, I've been granted apostleship. I've been granted opportunity to help guide uh, 
church. As I guide the church, I want to tell you that we need to have a sober evaluation of ourselves and not think ourselves higher than we think or lower than we need to think I am, which is equally as bad. This white good trend thing and say we need to have a have, have, have a sober evaluation of who we are. We need to thank God and humility for our salvation. But when it comes to working in God's church and working out our salvation, we have no reason to boast even uh, as we have no reason to boast about our salvation, we can thank God for our salvation and we ought to thank God that everybody in God's church is gifted enough to work in some area where God can get the glory and Christ can be shown as our boss man of the church. All the churches of God are members of the Church Universal. We're on our way to being one day the church triumphant in heaven, but right now we're the church universal, and because we are the Holy Catholic Church, meaning universal church, we all have something to offer. One denomination is not better than another denomination. And even in the same denomination, one church is no better than the other church. All of us are in the church of God, and all of us have a contribution to make to the church of God. Therefore, by implication, no members in the local church who claim discipleship in Christ are inferior to anybody else anywhere in the world or in the church where they belong because God has gifted every child of God with at least one, and just about everybody in here has more than one, but at least one spiritual gift. God's calling us to use those gifts to magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are sovereignly bestowed upon us by God and our Father and they're distributed throughout the body by the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit makes distribution of the gifts to the churches. He doesn't make any mistakes. He's God. God never made a mistake in his life. That's what all the preachers say, and I've said it before. When he made you, he was at his level best. When he created the church in Christ Jesus, he was at his level best. And we all thank him that we matter to. We're not at the bottom of the totem pole. We don't have to feel like we're left behind. We don't have to feel like we're on top of everybody else. He did say that he made us the head and not the tail. But here I am talking about understanding where we stand before God in terms of our biblical gifting. And that is that God can use all of us in some way to do something for him. As Paul talks, he talks about speaking gifts in this passage. He talks about uh, uh, leading gifts. He talks about giving and serving gifts for aliens. And all of those gifts that are mentioned, about six or seven here, fit us somewhere at some point in our life. I'm going to make a statement, and I'll try to deal with it as we go along with this study, that um, while the gifts are all working in God's church, God may amplify a gift of his pleasure in you in some way that he has not amplified your other gifts as he has used them in times past. So don't get hung up when something's working because you see, you're a routine person. I'm a routine person. We're comfortable in what we do, but sometimes God will use us in some other areas where we're needed because we are available. So our thing is to be available to God every step of the way that God wants to use us. To bless the body of Christ within, that's you and me, to bless each other, and then to reach out and touch the lives of somebody else and tell them about this great salvation that we have so that they can hear 
about our king and his kingdom and become voluntarily his subjects and come into his house and partake of all the things that are on the king's table and become the king's kids. God has given everybody something they can do in his church. Paul said, as we talk about this whole business of spiritual gifts, he said we need to understand how God uses them in relationship to us. And here's where Paul really kind of hovers down on this idea about understanding where we stand because he said nobody can really thumb their nose at somebody else saying, I got four gifts and you know that's what children do. They go around going, nah, 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 nah. That's not what we do in the church. He said everybody in the church is to understand that he or she is not to lift themselves up in pride. Pride, golden football, haughty spirit before destruction. We need to be very careful of that. But he said, think soberly. And think soberly means that you have a proper estimation of who you are in Christ. You won't let anybody tell you that you're not a child of God. You know that. And you're not going to take a back seat to anybody who tells you I'm more spiritual than you are. No, sir. Nobody has more Holy Ghost than you have. We'll get to that when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, around the 13th verse. We've all been baptized in the Spirit. And let me just take a minute to say being baptized in the Spirit means that you are placed or positioned with that adoption, stand as a child of God, but we all need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which means that the Spirit has to have more of us. How much of us? Yeah, you know, we can be stingy with the Spirit. We, we tell the Lord, I don't mind letting you have me today, but I'm not going to let you have me tomorrow because that's too much control. Being Spirit-filled means being Spirit-controlled. Spirit control. Spirit control. I don't care how many tongues you may speak in, how much power you have as a preacher. If you're not controlled by the Lord, you are out of order. He said, think soberly of yourself according to the measure of the doctrine you've been taught. This faith we're talking about is not faith for salvation, but the faith that comes, or the belief that comes from the scriptures. Uh, the Greek word is pistis, and the idea of pistis is a belief. The belief that we're about to talk about, so I've been teaching you all this stuff, now pay attention. You've been reading about it all your life. It's time you start paying attention. Now, that will forget I made it happen, and it's a good one. I'm doing it now a little bit more slower on purpose. But, but I read through several different translations, one right behind the other. And at one point, the Lord said to me, now listen. He said, I appreciate you reading my word. You got to know that word. And I'm letting that word get out of you. He said, but there comes a point you need to do something with that word. That's why we say in those seven things that we believe we are, we are Bible practice and just peace. That means that, what was that sermon I preached? Bible dead, Bible red, and Bible faith. Yeah. And we ought to be able to go into the scripture. On the Bible, just the bottom, when we were over home, Cascade, she said, you at least, if you, if you don't know the address, you ought to at least know the street. <laughs> Amen. When you start walking down the street, you're going to find the address in the scripture. The Lord will lead me the passage of the scripture and you'll say there's a message in there for you and you will know it when you get there. Yeah. And there's something in your heart that just sort of builds up, jumps out, and the text stands out and the Lord says, hey, talk to you. So Paul said, according to the measure of faith, all this stuff I've been teaching you, pay attention because God has given you what you need 
to be able to operate in the gifting that you're in. And can I say to you, we also learn when we don't think too much of ourselves and don't think too little of ourselves, we stay in our hand. Can I, can I borrow your words to the current? Stay in your lane. You don't need to hop over into my area. I don't need to hop over in your area. And we only need to be over there when God puts us over there. And if God has to put you over there, let him know. So Paul said, take a sober evaluation of yourself. You've been given belief, a belief system. You've been given the doctrine that is the measure of the faith. And it took me a long time to kind of get this, but thank God I finally got it. The, 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 the measure of all that teaching you have received, that's supposed to help ground you in the operation of your gifts. Paul yeah. well, takes the analogy and said, if we think about the human body, then maybe we can get an understanding about the body of Christ. And I had this strange feeling, as one of my professors used to say in seminary, and, and Peter Wagner, when he wrote on spiritual gifts, there's some folk out there who want to be lone rangers. They don't want to cooperate. Paul said, I, I need you to see how the body is. Just, just touch yourself just a minute. You ain't gonna feel that, weren't you? The body has many members. Move your fingers for just a minute. Now we're gonna get toes in your shoes if they aren't out of your shoes. Your shoes, you know, your feet aren't you. Yeah, move your arm. Move your hand. Your brain has told you how to move. Every body living has a brain, whether they use it or not is another thing, but everybody has a brain. And the brain operates all and communicates to all of the body. We have eyes and ears and noses and mouths and tongues and we have limbs and we have ligaments and we have tissue and we have bones and, and each bone is connected to its bone. That's another sermon one of these days about the dry bone. And, 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 and we have a circulatory and a respiratory system. All those things make up the body. There may be some other things I'm not listening, but you get the idea and there is a head on your neck and your brain in your head tells those parts of the body what to do. And that's why it's so devastating when somebody has a stroke, they really can't move sometimes. Uh, those things, the brain and, and the system is not functioning properly. But Paul said, let the system of the church function properly. Why, Paul? Because Christ is the brains of the church. He's the head. Go read Ephesians chapter 1. When you get out to, to 20, 2nd, 23rd, 24th verses. And whatever those verses say there, one of the things they amplify is that God put all things under Christ. Christ is the head of the church. We have many members in the body. We are Christ's body. You can't go there to that analogy in, in marriage. Paul made that statement about no man ever hated his own body. And he really relates that to how we treat our wives, brethren. You don't go around treating yourself. You don't go around stabbing, slapping yourself around, so you don't go around slapping no woman around. Well, that would part of this. But the idea of the analogy is there that the body is to be taken care of, and if Christ is our head, we ought to follow where the head is leading us. Just an introduction to simply say many things go on in the body, but we got one head. We ought to follow where the head is leading. And Paul is really warning us against running off in our own direction. I wish to God that the Congress of the United States of America could realize that they are many members, but they're one body. 
And no matter who they are, across which side of the aisle they sit, on left or right, or moderates in between on both sides, they are members one of the other. Families do better when everybody is working toward the same goals. The children can't have different goals than the parents when the parents are the head of the house. Help me, Holy Ghost. And neither can we function well as a local church when we don't do what God is saying that we ought to do because if Christ is our head, we ought not have to apologize for what we do. Many members, but only one body. There's only one church. That's the church of God. There's only one church. The church of God. And it's in Jesus Christ, only one church, there are many local churches, there are many churches, but only one body. Paul said we are members one of another. Well, for pastor, you said all that. Wrap it up by telling God's people that everybody has something they can do in the body. The hand is just as important as the foot. The eyes are just as important as the ears. And Paul is saying to us that every part of us ought to function as a whole and everybody matters. He said, you need to operate along the lines of what you've been taught in the scripture. And the Greek translator said, we supply the word, let us use. So Paul says, there are different categories here of gifts. He said, but we got to understand we are one body and we have many gifts, we're one body and we have many members and we all function differently as a part of the whole because we're trying to reach a goal and that's the glory of my God. Oh, come here, Paul. Paul said that uh, if you have some grace in you, and I know you do, each gift differs according to how God has favored you. You know, you don't turn your children to do some things that they aren't capable of doing. You give them responsibilities in response to how they handle each command you give. Some things are increased as you go along. The apostle said, Jesus over in Luke 17, Lord, increase our faith. So Paul said, according to the amount of grace that's been given to you for the work you have done. He said that if you operate along the lines of what's been given to you, you're going to operate fine if you learn to prophesy. Now, that has nothing to do with the office of the prophet. Any member of the church, when they are enabled can prophesy. Prophesy simply means you're speaking the mind of God. Come here, Paul, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul said that, that, that when we prophesy, we are encouraging, we are uh, consoling, we are warning, we are offering uh, some words to build up the church. Once in a while, when we testify, somebody will get a prophecy and say, God is really saying we can keep on keeping on. And you know that's true because when the Lord speaks, he does not speak uh, in contradiction to his word. So anybody who gets up and says anything crazy and says I'm prophesying in really operating in the spirit of the Lord. But when you operate in the spirit of the Lord, you can give a word of refreshment that comes from the word of God. And it might simply be that God says, stand and sing, be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. That's 
in proportion to the faith base that God has given to us in His Word. Yes, He said, if His prophecy, then let us prophesy according to the amount of Scripture learning, the basis of our faith learning, our belief system that God has given to us. If it is ministry, anybody can minister. Now, we go around calling preachers ministers, but the word ministers means to serve in some distinctive place that will bless the overall institution where you serve. And you ought to serve based on what the scripture said. That's the measure of your belief system. How do you know T.D. Wimp Smith Jr. because I heard God say to Isaiah that we ought to remember the widows and the orphans. Yes, I heard Jesus saying that we ought to visit those who are in prison. Yeah, Jesus said to us, we ought to give at least a cool cup of water in a disciple's name. Good God Almighty, I feel the boss man here in the measure of my faith. That which he's given to me to believe out of the scriptures and we ought to do ministry. It might mean that you're ushering on the door. But uh, I want to tell you uh, that's a ministry that falls uh, in the line uh, of being a blessing uh, to somebody else. Uh, but the overall institution is called a service gift. Uh, you might be a deacon, uh, and the deacons uh, learn to serve uh, because that's what the word serve means. Uh, and in the Bible, uh, deacons serve. Uh, those who were widows and those who were orphans and helped the church who followed out of conflict and brought them into consolation. Yes, Paul said, if you minister, then let us serve in our ministry. Anybody can teach that God enables to bring light to a passage on the word of God. Everybody is not called a teacher, but in the moment uh, that there is no teacher, that if you're available to God, uh, God just might want to use you uh, to bring some light on the scripture. Uh, you may have the teaching gift, uh, but here Paul is saying, uh, you may not be a preacher, but there's some people in the church uh, with a teaching gift uh, that can also teach uh, the truths of God and influence somebody to follow the direction of God. Yes! Good God Almighty, if you got a teaching gift, you ought to teach and wait on your teaching or rather serve and use your teaching to the glory of God. What about exhortation? Isn't that the role of a prophet? Yes, but exhorting simply means coming alongside somebody and putting your arm around them and whispering to them a good word in due season.